Okay, welcome back off the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at um, Titus chapter 1, verse 1, uh, where we're talking about uh, the promise of eternal life, which uh, is uh, a sure promise uh, because it rests on God's uh, eternal nature that he cannot lie and his eternal promises because it comes from a God whose nature uh, is, uh, you know, who does not speak lies, is free from falsehood and uh, he's free from all uh, deceit and truthful and uh, trustworthy. And we also see that Paul says that, you know, uh, this promise of eternal life that God uh, you know, spoke even before time. So go, uh, Paul goes on to show that this eternal life is promised, was not promised uh, just when, you know, Adam and Eve sinned, uh, but it was something that God uh, already thought about it in eternity past, even before the uh, foundations of this world. And it's not something that he just made a last minute or uh, at the moment decision, you know, but it's something that, uh, you know, he has already had foreknowledge or pre-planned uh, something that uh, stretches back, the promises of God stretches back into eternity uh, past. Um, verse 3 says, but as in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our uh, Savior. So even as God had planned everything, the whole plan of redemption, the whole plan of salvation, everything that was already uh, settled in his mind. Uh, it was, it's a done, completed thing in eternity past with the Lamb of uh, uh, God already being slain from the foundations of the world as we read in um, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. So even before Adam and Eve sinned, even before God created Adam and Eve, even before they sinned, uh, in God's mind, the whole plan, uh, redemption plan of salvation was a done completed uh, thing. That is who God uh, is. So it was something that was already settled in eternity past, uh, uh, but the message was proclaimed, was made known uh, in God's own time and, uh, you know, according to his own purpose and was revealed uh, uh, in the, the fullness of time in the Kairos moment. So even though all of this was completed in the heart and mind of God, even before he even spoke out these promises there in the Garden of Eden, you know, we have the um, Edenic, a covenant which God makes uh, uh, when he is pronouncing the curse. He says, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, which is the Edenic uh, covenant which God makes. Even before he makes all this covenant and promises, you know, it's already uh, completed in his heart and mind. He already has foreknowledge, thought about it. But in his own time, he reveals it according to his own uh, purpose. So in the Old Testament, we see that there is an uh, anticipation of the salvation message, uh, which was prophesied, which was spoken of by the prophets, and all of the things that God ordained uh, in the Old Testament, whether it is the tabernacle, whether it's the rituals, whether it's the sacrifices, uh, the covenants, uh, whether it is the, uh, you know, the ceremonies that they have to follow, everything spoke of this uh, servant uh, uh, Messiah, the servant king who would come, this Messiah would come. And so everything, whether it's the tabernacle, whether it's the priesthood, whether it's the sacrifices, the rituals, uh, whether it is the, uh, the ceremonies, everything we see is fulfilled in the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. So the the message has not only been made evident uh, in the historical ev uh, events of uh, the life, uh, uh, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but Paul is saying, you know, all of this is evident in history, but it has to be spoken of. It has to be made known to the world today uh, in Titus, uh, in Paul's time, in our time uh, as well. And so, you know, uh, you know, Christianity uh, came into a world, in, into the world in a time when it was, uh, you know, uh, 
uniquely possible for this message to spread rapidly because there was a common language which was Greek. Uh, the Roman Empire uh, controlled most of uh, uh, you know, the world. Uh, their empire was very vast and travel was somewhat easy because you know this popular saying all roads lead to Rome and also uh, it was proclaimed you know at the right moment God sent his son because you know the world was very conscious of its need for a messiah for a savior and uh, uh, William Barclay was one of the commentary writers says there was never a time when the hearts of men were more open to receive the message of salvation uh, which the Christian missionaries uh, brought. So uh, God brought about his plan of salvation into full effect at the Kairos moment, the right moment when the world was, it was easy for uh, you know the gospel to be propagated and the world was looking more than ever before uh, for a Messiah. And uh, Paul says that it is through preaching, he says, you know, in the due time uh, manifested his word through preaching. So it is through preaching, um, you know, it's a way that uh, God's eternal work meets people today. So preaching is a way God's word is made more manifest, made more uh, a reality, something that people can experience, taste, touch, see, and just, you know, uh, and experience a tangible manifest presence of God. And then he goes on to say, that this preaching of the gospel was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our uh, Savior. So Paul viewed this message and its proclamation of preaching, uh, you know, uh, uh, the gospel. Uh, he was, he said that he was committed, which means, uh, you know, uh, the Greek word means here to have faith to entrust. So the meaning here is to be entrusted with something. So Paul is saying, you know, I've been entrusted. I've been given the privilege, the responsibility to proclaim this message. And Paul knew that, uh, you know, this work of uh, of uh, teaching the gospel has been entrusted to him, uh, but not to him only, but it's also committed to all believers. And Paul sees uh, preaching the gospel uh, or teaching the gospel or uh, the proclamation of the gospel as a treasure, you know, which he says uh, is entrusted to him. So it's a big treasure that has been uh, entrusted to him. So here in Titus, the apostle, uh, you know, is uh, actually becoming an example to Titus and to the people at Crete uh, and also an example to us that the message of us, the Savior is given to us. It's a privilege, it's a responsibility. We have been given the truth of the gospel. We have been given the word of God as a treasure for safekeeping. And it's not like a treasure that needs to be hidden in a safe deposit, kept under lock and key, but you know, in a box uh, like we keep our other important uh, treasures. But it is something that has been entrusted to us to proclaim, to share it, uh, with others. So this, uh, uh, this God-given trust or responsibility or privilege is to proclaim the gospel. It's not something that we just take it or leave it, uh, 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 you know, uh, it's not like a take it or leave it matter for the Christians. It's not even an option that has been given to us. Um, and Paul is saying it's not an option that is given, but you know, it is mandatory because the Great Commission, you know, tells us to preach and teach and to make disciples of all nations. So we have been entrusted with this responsibility, with this, uh, with this privilege, uh, and the command has been given uh, by the Savior to all believers to preach and uh, teach. So we need to preach and teach like we just looked at uh, in the last class in 2 Timothy chapter 4, you know, preach and teach the word of God uh, uh, in, in, in all its entirety, in its truth, with the right interpretation in place, in season and out of season, which means when you feel like, when you don't feel like, whatever, do it at all times. Uh, Types, okay, so this great commission has been uh, given to the disciples, to Paul as an apostle, to us, and to the church also. 
and it's a command and it's not something that we can just take it or leave it matter but something is given as a command as a trust and it's an awesome responsibility for us a privilege that we need to preach and teach the uh, gospel and then he goes on to say that you know uh, who, this gospel has been committed to me according to the command of god our uh, savior so paul identifies god as his savior you know it's a it's a it's an awesome title to uh, see God as a savior God uh, and it's very it stresses the very nature and the very heart of God that is his heart to save people uh, and a heart to you know uh, free people from a uh, sin from the penalty of sin the power of sin um, so here is God who is concerned with man's salvation uh, and salvation from sin's penalty uh, sin's power and the ultimately from the presence of sin. So when we die, we are in God's presence, we are ultimately freed from the presence of sin. So we see here the very heart of God uh, concerning man's salvation. Verse 4 it says to Titus, a true son in the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So Paul is referring to T Titus as his son, true son. It was uh, uh, Paul who led Titus uh, to Christ, also mentored him and, uh, you know, uh, made him grow in his spiritual growth and brought him to a place where he can serve God. Uh, and become a co-labor, a co-companion alongside Paul. And he says, a true son in our common faith. So, you know, Paul and uh, Titus, um, uh, you know, had this relation of a father and son because of their common uh, faith, because of who they were in Christ Jesus. Uh, so by using this word common, Paul reminds us that, you know, uh, uh, what we hold in common with all believers is our faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the finished work of the cross, what he has done for us on the cross, what we believe in, what we have faith in, is what binds us all together. And because we believe that we are part of the spiritual family, you know, regardless of our nationality, our status, um, or who we are, but we are all part of this family because uh, of our faith in uh, uh, God who is our savior, who receives salvation for us and the finished work of the uh, cross. So all who have trusted in the Lord Jesus, you know, we stand uh, together as uh, fathers, as mothers, as, uh, you know, uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, in some cases, we are spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers. Some cases, we are uh, children. Some cases, we are brothers and sisters. And it is this common faith that provides the basis for harmony and communion and fellowship in the body of Christ. And then Paul goes on to talk about his normal greetings when he's talked about his credentials. Why is he uh, posing his credentials? It's not because, you know, he's uh, uh, he wants to just... Uh, uh, assert his authority on them but it's because you know his main aim is because he wants them to grow in the truth you know uh, be built on a strong foundation in their faith which will lead to uh, godliness and then he's talking about um, you know um, uh, 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 you know, all about uh, the hope that we have, the eternal life, God's uh, eternal nature and his eternal promises. And then he comes to greetings and he says, grace, mercy and peace, uh, which is Paul's very typical greetings and blessings, which he writes uh, uh, to the people because these words are very typical of uh, the greetings and blessings in the ancient world. And we see that Paul never changes the order of the blessings. He first says, grace you know and then he goes on to talk about mercy and then uh, peace so grace is basically the unmerited favor of god and uh, it is completely dependent and characterized and personalized by in jesus christ himself it's because of god's great mercy and uh, uh, grace and mercy that we are part of his uh, family that we have received uh, salvation and as a result of this you know we experience peace so um, 
we experience peace only in, in our response uh, by faith to this grace and mercy that uh, you know Christ has revealed to us, that God has revealed to us in the person and work of uh, Jesus Christ. And he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So when Paul uses these words, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, you know, he's not just using it as a formality, uh, or making a statement, that, you know, as a typical formal statement. But Paul knew that the source of all grace, mercy, and peace comes from nowhere else other than God and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our uh, Savior. So in all of his epistle greetings, Paul teaches us that there can be neither grace nor peace without a personal relationship with God the Father and with uh, Jesus Christ, our uh, Savior. Now, the pronoun "our Savior," you know, stresses uh, the need of personal faith and points to the common relationship all believers have uh, together. So, it's our personal faith, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, uh, on which basis we receive grace, mercy, and peace. And also it's because our faith that binds us along with people of the similar faith, you know, uh, that believers have together that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. Okay. So that is uh, verses 1 to 4. Anyone has any questions before we go on to verses 5 to 9? Yes, Sasha. Yes, Sasha. Uh, Pastor, in, I was just comparing the book of Timothy and Titus. So, in both the chapter where it says, in like to Timothy, my true child in the faith, and to Titus, my true child in a common faith. So, here's He's talking about his spiritual son, right? Like, um, I know Paul did not get married and all, but how did he, like, um, see, so was Titus a younger man or the, like, how Timothy was young in, I don't know how to explain, Pastor. Sorry, I was just kind of curious. Yes. Uh, so when Paul is saying that uh, he's referring to Titus and Timothy as his son in the faith, which means that you know he's much older to them and we also see that you know uh, when he puts uh, timothy in uh, uh, and leaves him in ephesus he's 30 plus and paul was much older so yes as a father and son relationship so these two were younger because he brought them to faith he mentored them and paul was much older to them that's why he says son in the thank faith. you sir. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then we'll move on to verses 5 to 9. So can somebody please read verses 5 to 9, please? This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what rem remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable or a lover of good self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contract it. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So here Paul is again writing what he has written to First Timothy, uh, sorry, Timothy in First Timothy chapter 3 is talking about how to choose uh, elders, leaders, bishops uh, in the congregation. And he starts verse 5 by saying, you know, the reason I left you in Crete, uh, you know, he says, states a reason is to build stable churches 
uh, with uh, much mature qualified pastors uh, for the believers there. And uh, we also know that, you know, the Cretans were a wild bunch, they were known as liars, lazy people. And so, you know, Titus had this responsibility to find suitable leaders to train them uh, to oversee the churches uh, and to minister to the people uh, in the churches at Crete. And so he says, you know, I left you there in Crete to set in order. Uh, the Greek word for order here means to straighten further, which means already there was some work done when Paul and Titus were there in Crete, but this is to straighten further what needs to be done more. Uh, to correct in addition, that is what the Greek word. So, you know, when you actually study this, the Old Testament, New Testament in Greek, it gives you such a, a much more deeper meaning. So, because when you read here, it's set in order, which means, okay, then we think that there's no order in the church at Crete. So, Paul is telling uh, Timoth uh, Titus, you know, hey, set the churches in uh, uh, Crete at all in order. But if you look at the Greek word, it says, you know, you can read it as set in order means straight, uh, set uh, uh, straighten uh, further or you know correct in addition that means already the work has done but further more work needs to be done you know there was some correction that has already taken place but in further addition uh, to the uh, to the correction that needs to take place uh, so do what needs to be done there so that which means he's saying uh, to what has already been done you know, so he's telling Paul, the reason why uh, Titus, um, the reason why I left you in Crete is, um, you know, to set what has already been done to further strengthen uh, or straighten and to bring further uh, correction in addition to what I have already been has already been done. So look at, you know, how just uh, the change in the Greek word from the English word has such more richer and uh, deeper meaning. So here Paul is saying, you know, telling Titus, hey, uh, we began the work at Crete, but I want you to continue the work that uh, has still to be done. Uh, otherwise, it would be like, you know, we gave birth to uh, children, we cared for them uh, for a little while, and then we abandoned them by leaving them on someone else's doorstep. Uh, so, you know, he's telling Titus, you need to preach and teach so that they can grow spiritually and appoint uh, godly leaders uh, uh, so, uh, so that they can build up those who are ba babies in the faith so what work has been done can be strengthened further and there can be more correction that is being brought in uh, from what we have already established at Crete. And he says, set in order the things that are lacking. So, you know, uh, he's saying, you know, set in order the things that are lacking, uh, which means that, you know, there was more work to be done at Crete uh, than, than at Ephesus where Timothy was, because, you know, if you compare the work of Titus at Crete and the work of Ty uh, Timothy in Ephesus, uh, you know, it shows, uh, Paul does not mention, you know, anything that is much more lacking among the uh, congregation or set in order what is lacking uh, at Ephesus. He does not tell Timothy this, but he tells it to uh, 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 Titus, which means that, which shows that there is some things that are more lacking among the congregation uh, or the believers at Crete. And then he goes on to say, appoint elders. Uh, elders here is the Greek word is presbyteros. Uh, who are also called as bishops uh, in you know in this in the same chapter in verse seven. So in the early church, these terms bishop, elders, presbyters were used interchangeably and referred to anyone providing a spiritual leadership. So uh, you know Paul is saying these leaders who you choose for the church should not be chosen by popular vote or they should not be chosen. Um, because of their own self-promotion, but it was Titus' job to look for able men, for godly men with that kind of character, which Paul is describing in the verses below. And he says, appoint them as leaders in the uh, congregation. So if a local church, you know, or believers uh, in, a, in a congregation, you know, lack good godly leaders, you know, uh, 
then you know there can be a total breakdown in the structure of the church the church will not grow um and the obvious reason is you know uh, god has chosen this office of elders the function of, uh, of these elders of giving oversight to the churches of shepherding the the, the flock under the care uh, he has set all of this in place in order to bring about spiritual growth spiritual uh, nurturing so you know um, the reason why paul is mentioning this about how to choose leaders is saying because god has chosen this office of leaders and god has ordained their function which is to shepherd uh, the flock under their care and he's saying god has done this in order that you know people or believers can grow spiritually so it's not just me telling you what to do and who to choose and what kind of leaders that needs to be there but he's saying that this is what god has already uh, ordained you know has uh, desires and what he has you know has put into the governmental structure in the uh, church and he says you know um, uh, appoint elders in every city which means you know it was a big job because crete was famous for having many cities and then he says you know appoint leaders in every city as i command you so paul is uh, you know saying acting uh, paul is saying that you need to act on uh, his authoritative instruction and titus was now responsible to carry out those instructions in the church at crete so in verses 6 to 9 paul lists out you know what titus must look for in leaders uh, he paul basically lists out qualifications and we can divide these qualifications into four categories one is domestic qualification, second one is personal qualification, third is positive qualification, and the fourth one is doctrinal qualification. Okay. So we look at the domestic qualification. Uh, verse 6, he says, if a man is blameless, husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Now we looked at all of this in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, so I'll just kind of go through it quickly. Now, blameless, the Greek word means somebody who is without accusation, somebody who cannot be charged with anything that is wrong. So he's saying the leader, the basic most important thing that a leader should have is that he should be a blameless leader, which means no one in the church or in the world or outside can bring any charge against him. That means he must be a man who's living a righteous life. And all that he does, everything that he does, people can see this utter righteousness in him. So this word blameless stands at the head of the list uh, as a quality which covers the whole of the elder's life. And uh, the qualifications that follow below, uh, uh, which he talks about in detail, you know, will test his blamelessness. Then he must be the husband of one wife, that means faithful to his wife, um, a one woman man. Uh, and he must, uh, you know, have having faithful children, which means uh, Paul is saying that, you know, his children must be those who uh, believe uh, if, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, if he's not able to, if a man is not able to lead his own family, then how can he, you know lead the family of god he must first demonstrate his ability to lead his own children and then you know he can lead his own lead the family of god or the church or the believers in the church and uh, this words dispensation uh, this special this inspiration or insubordination uh, means that you know the family of the elders must be such that they cannot be accused of uh, you know dissipation which means uh, the greek word here refers to wild uh, self-indulgent and wasteful manner of life um, and you know it just talks about the prodigal son you know went who lived in, uh, uh, in a wasteful manner of life very wild kind of living very self-indulgent uh, so the family members should not be these kind of people. Uh, neither should they be rebellious. Uh, you know, if um, 
if their own children or their own family or their wives not able to submit uh, to authority, whether it's parental authority or the spouse's authority, and a man is not able to, you know, train them, uh, teach them how to submit to authority, if he's not able to train and govern his own children, you know, then how can he be able to lead the flock of God, bring them under the submission, the authority and the obedience uh, uh, to Christ and to his truth and uh, to his laws. So, you know, uh, he says, if he's able to conduct his own household well, his children well, then, you know, he'll be able to take care of the church as well. But that is domestic qualification. Verse 7 talks about personal qualifications and then he he's, he begins uh, this by verse 7 by saying for a bishop so now in this verse there is a switch from the term elder to that of the bishop so the bishop uh, 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 you know in the Greek word it means somebody who's a superintendent a guardian and overseer so uh, uh, Paul is basically talking about the same office but now moves the term uh, bishop because it stresses the work or the function of the elder as overseer. So he's moving from just a title to coming down to more specific where he's stressing about the function of the elders or the overseers. So he says while there is dignity and honor in the office of the elder as an appointed uh, leader of uh, God's flock, uh, the focus here is on the work that they have to do, the work of oversight for which certain qualities uh, are very, very necessary, are very vital uh, to one being a good steward. Then Paul continues with the list of qualifications. He has to be a steward of God. We studied this word, a steward, oikonomos, which basically means somebody who is able to manage a household or a manager of a household, or somebody who is in charge of household affairs. So it basically, uh, this word steward uh, portrays the idea of, uh, you know, somebody who is uh, greatly accountable, a very responsible person who is appointed to this place of responsibility and appointment and, uh, you know, has this privilege of carrying on this responsibility and, and uh, who, you know, is able to do things in the right way um, and the one who dispenses God's goods and blessings to others through this responsibility, through this privilege as a steward. And then he says, somebody who is not self-willed, quick temper, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Uh, self-willed means the Greek word is self-pleasing, arrogant, refusing to listen to others. So basically the idea is, you know, it's not somebody who is self-centered, um, you know, some, somebody who is not wanting their own way uh, in everything, not somebody who is self-focused, but who is God-focused. Not quick tempered means not somebody who does not use their temper when they see something that is wrong or get angry when they see something that is wrong or not right. But here he's talking basically about somebody who's constantly losing their temper, constantly getting angry and who's constantly feeding their anger against others and erupting and, you know, trying to um, uh, have these, uh, you know, flashes of anger uh, on on and off, you know, and, you know, on a continual basis, basically, okay? And not just once in a while, but it's a continual basis of just being angry all the time and losing their temper against others. Not given to wine. Now, the Greek word for wine is uh, para onios. Uh, para means alongside. That's where we get parakletos, you know, the Holy Spirit uh, who comes alongside us. Para is alongside. You know, and onios means wine. So it basically means somebody who's always alongside the wine. Okay, somebody who's always sitting along with his wine and becomes drunk and is under the control of uh, uh, the wine rather than the spirit. Okay, then somebody who's not violent. Um, it's basically the Greek word here is, uh, you know, somebody who strikes when they get angry, who's a fighter. Uh, you know, um, uh, so, you know, somebody who's getting very physical, not just verbal abuse, but also physical abuse uh, when they're losing anger, uh, when they lose a temper. So basically, 
uh, quick-tempered, somebody who's constantly getting angry and getting very uh, physical or violent when um, uh, they get angry. And not greedy for money. We looked at this in First Timothy chapter 6, First Timothy chapter 3. Again, he talks about, you know, uh, the person should be free from the love of money. And so basically, look for somebody who is not concerned about laying treasures here on earth, but working for the kingdom of uh, God. And then uh, talks about positive qualifications in verses uh, 8, hospitable. You know, in those days, uh, people had to be hospitable. That means they had to entertain guests, accommodate guests in their homes, basically because of the persecution, so they could not stay in any inns uh, because, uh, you know, they would uh, be exposed to insult, danger, and persecution. So when they traveled, you know, it was the believers who had to open their homes for these people who were traveling. And also for fellow believers who are from, you know, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, the Gentile background uh, who are facing uh, persecution, persecuted by their own uh, family or rendered homeless. So the need for hospital uh, to be hospitable, uh, for hospitality, to open their homes to others. Well, this cannot be the case in our culture today, but you know, as time progresses, we're seeing a lot of persecution happening and it will also require us to open our homes to accommodate uh, uh, people and just, you know, to show the love of Christ to them through hospitality. And then lover of what is good, which means um, somebody who is um, devoted to what is good or beneficial, uh, whether in word or deeds or even the things that they uh, do somebody who is uh, a sober-minded you know um, a sober-minded person is somebody who's able to think clearly with clarity um, you know a soundness of mind or a sound mind is uh, you know comes only when uh, we are living on the word of god or we are feeding our minds uh, with the word of god and the word that is, uh, you know, uh, is being fed into our minds and uh, is in our hearts will translate in our values, in our attitudes, and will bring about a self-control. Um, so the mind of the Apostle Paul, you know, this was an important quality for uh, a leader that they had to be sober-minded. Um, uh, it suggests that, you know, they know the value of things and they don't cheapen uh, the ministry or the gospel message by their foolish behavior. And then he says somebody who's just holy and self-controlled just means somebody who's, you know, uh, right toward men, holy, somebody who's in right standing or holy towards God, and self-controlled, somebody who is right towards himself, you know, controlled in the various aspects of their mind, whether in their words, their thoughts, their attitudes, their behavior. So being just is having a right attitude towards men holy is right towards uh, god and self control is right towards themselves okay and we know that self control is one of the gifts of the holy uh, fruit of the holy spirit sorry the fruit of the holy spirit and um, you know the greek word uh, refers to self control refers to strength or power that is needed to restrain or control uh, one's um, passion. So when our life is under the control of the Holy Spirit, when we are walking the Spirit and led by the Spirit, you know, uh, we will um, uh, we will show forth a self-controlled uh, life. A, a self-controlled life is really the self under the control of the Holy Spirit and is a life which is equipped um, with the Word of God and um, you know, like we see in uh, the next section where we talk about, uh, you know, the doctrinal qualification, where in verse 9 he says, you know, hold fast to the faithful word, uh, which means he's telling uh, Titus, you know, study the word of God, know it, not only study and know it, but also live by the word of God. 
so that you can be a faithful messenger preaching and teaching the truth in God's word. You can teach it to people who are childlike in their faith. You can use it to defend it against the people who are attacking um, the truth in God's word. Um, and also that you can, you know, protect this treasure uh, this revelation of this truth in God's word that has been entrusted, has been given to us as a privilege, as a uh, responsibility. So the leader must uh, must be sure of the faithful word of God for himself. And when he is able to do that for himself, he can bring or teach the word of God to people. And when he teaches it, he must teach it with, uh, with confidence and authority. And his confidence is based on how he has, uh, you know, tasted and seen and lived out those truths of God's word for himself and also speaks with his authority because he knows it's the truth. It's the living word. It's a revelation of God's word. And, um, you know, uh, he uh, must preach and teach not with just some theological guesswork, uh, but, you know, or with doubts like these false teachers, but know what is the truth, be strong in that, be founded in that, and you know, uh, uh, then preach it and uh, teach it. And so he's saying that you know, the preacher and teacher should not uh, follow the trends that are there around them, what the false teachers are teaching, but just hold on to the truth. And then he says that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, convict those who contradict. So he's saying the uh, sound doctrine, you know, um, he says a godly leader uh, will use his solid foundation of God's word both to exhort and to refute. That means to exhort is to strengthen, build up the faith of the believers and refute means to, you know, stop those who are teaching false teachings, false doctrines with the truth. So the word both highlights the fact that leaders need the ability uh, to both exhort and to refute. So even as some of us want to preach and teach God's word, we need to use it to exhort people, to build up and strengthen their faith, and also to refute the false teachings and the uh, doctrines that are there. So he says a godly leader deals with those who contradict uh, the truth with the sound doctrine. Um, uh, he does not should not do it in an arrogant way, but the authority that comes from God and do that in a way that will bring correction with the sound doctrine that he is preaching or uh, teaching. So he says that, you know, when you preach and teach the sound doctrine, it will convict, which means it will show people their fault it will convince them uh, you know rebuke them and reprove them so the greek word for convict is basically means to tell a fault to convince reprove and rebuke so do it the encouraging way so that people are convinced of their uh, uh, sin their the uh, the 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 false that the falsehood that is there and it will lead them to either convince uh, confess the truth uh, or at least be convicted of their uh, sins. So he's saying, you know, do it in such a way that it convinces or rebukes someone in such a powerful and effective way through the truth of God's word that it will lead them to either confess the truth uh, and also be convicted of their, or at least be convicted of their sin. And then he goes on to say that, you know, those who contradict, which means, you know, use the sound doctrine uh, to exhort to convict and also use it against those who contradict. So the Greek word for contradict basically means refuse the truth, uh, answer again, deny and speak against. So those who are speaking against the truth, deny the truth, you know, refuse the truth, you know, you need to use the sound doctrine against them uh, because there are always people who stand and speak against um, and opposed to sound teaching of scripture. Um, but he says that the church needs elders who are not only able to teach the truth, but also defend 
uh, the false teachers, the false doctrines, with the truth of uh, the scripture, uh, with the truth and the revelations that is there in the word of God. And, um, you know, we, uh, the Apostle Peter tells us, you know, we need to be ready to make a defense uh, to everyone who asks us to give an account for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And he says we need to do this with gentleness and reverence. Even when Paul is writing to Timothy, we saw in 2 Timothy that he says, even as you correct and rebuke and teach, do it with all you know humility, with reverence and gentleness and great uh, patience, forbearance, he uses the word there, so patience. Okay, we'll stop here at verse 9. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then um, uh, we had a question on uh, uh, the last class, uh, you know, whether it was John Mark who um, uh, wrote, you know, uh, uh, the Mark's Gospel. Uh, yes, the authorship of the Gospel of Mark is uh, not definitely known, uh, but there is some scholarly debate on this matter. But, you know, tradition, however, says that, you know, uh, this Gospel uh, of Mark was, was written or is attributed to uh, John Mark, who is a companion of the Apostle uh, Peter. So, you know, this uh, they attribute uh, the Gospel of Mark uh, to be written by John Mark because of the early Christian tradition and the testimony of some of the church fathers uh, who say that, you know, it was uh, Mark who wrote down Peter's teachings and his antidotes about Jesus. And um, uh, hence, you know, tradition has it that, you know, it was he who wrote uh, uh, Mark's gospel. But uh, even though there is this traditional attribution to John Mark, modern scholars still question you know, whether uh, John Mark was really the author of the gospel. Uh, some people you know, suggest that uh, the author may be someone else who basically used Mark's name as a pseudonym uh, or that the gospel was compiled by several sources, you know, by unknown editors and so, However, you know, there's no consensus to all of these things. It's just theories. But tradition basically attributes this to John Mark, um, who um, who remains widely accepted as, uh, you know, based on the tradition that is uh, uh, there. So, yes, the Gospel of Mark, by tradition, say, is written by uh, John Mark. But um, the other question that we had was, you know, I think Rupa said, um, did Paul basically not take uh, John Mark because of the agreement uh, or the sharp disagreement that they, that Peter and Barnabas had against um, Paul uh, regarding the circumcision? Um, well, um, uh, it does not say that John Mark was... Uh, uh, along with them, we don't have that uh, written, but of course, you know, uh, in the New Testament, both Peter and Barnabas, we know, opposed Paul regarding uh, the circumcision, and we read this in the book of uh, Galatians, uh, where Paul writes about this uh, disagreement with Peter and Barnabas over the issue whether Gentile converts uh, to Christianity uh, should require or undergo circumcision. Um, but it does not say anywhere that, you know, uh, uh, John Mark was uh, along with them. But the reason why John, uh, Paul does not take uh, John Mark on a second missionary journey is because the basic reason, which I said last uh, class, was you know, because he deserted them uh, in, in midway during their first missionary journey. And hence, Paul did not want to... Uh, take uh, John Mark alone, uh, along with them for the second missionary journey. And uh, since Barnabas did not want to go alone without John Mark, he went ahead 
with John Mark, and we know that Paul took a uh, Silas, but it's uh, it's not because of this disagreement regarding circumcision that uh, Paul did not want to take him on his second uh, missionary journey. And then I think it was somebody else who posted uh, whether the young man mentioned in Mark chapter 14 verses 51 and 52, whether uh, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, this young man who was wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Uh, so was this John Mark? Um, well, it's not very clear from the text and scholars have debated about this identity uh, for centuries, but some suggest, uh, you know, it could have been uh, Mark himself, the, who is the author of the gospel, uh, while others say that he was a disciple or a bystander who happened to be present at that time. Uh, but however, the true identity of the young man, uh, you know, is still mysterious, it still remains a mystery. Uh, and the passage is uh, still open to interpretation. But uh, people say, or scripture scholars say that it's uh, John Mark himself, who is the cousin of uh, uh, Barnabas, who was you know, there and could cause quite possibly be him. But that's just speculation. They don't know for sure. Okay. So I think these are the three questions that were asked and I hope it's answered. Okay. Okay. Uh, if no one has any questions, we'll end class today. Anyone has any questions? Regarding Titus? No? Okay. Thank you all for uh, joining class. I'll see you next uh, Monday. Till then, have a blessed week ahead. God bless you. Thank you.